One. All right. So, you know, what's kind of weird. I was researching the story about the bear attacks and apparently I allowed the cursor to roll over something because what I have now is just fashion now women's fashion trends. Uh, and there's some lovely blouses here, uh, blouses and earrings and sandal sets. But that's not what I wanted to review. That's weird. That's weird. It's weird how the Internet works sometimes. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, we got a lot of stuff to talk about today. A lot of stuff to talk about today. And uh, Zach, before we get into it, I guess is this before the music or after the music? After the music. After the music. All right. Zach's been busy. Uh, doing lots of cool things for us, and uh, we're going to go ahead and let him play the music. Then he's going to tell us what he has in store for us. Welcome to Student of the Gun Radio, proudly brought to you from the SDS Imports studio. If you want quality that's affordable, visit sdsimports.com. We don't just talk guns and gear. We also discuss current events and politics, because guns are politics. Now sit back and listen louder to your co-host, CEO of Full 30, Jared Markle, and your beloved host, the pimp hand of America, Professor Paul Markle. All right, all right, all right. There we go. That is that is I. And we're going to get started with this. All right. In case you guys have not been paying attention, every single Friday, Zach puts out a Liberty Letter yes, to you guys, you folks. And he added something to this week's Liberty Letter that was kind of special. And uh, he's going to talk about it. And hopefully you guys will participate. Yes. Yes, indeed you do. Uh, every week, like Dad said on Friday, I put out the Liberty Letter. You might be asking, what the hell is Liberty Letter? Uh, that is just our newsletter that we send out every week with whatever we've been up to that week. You know, new, new articles, new videos, new uh, radio episodes, all that good stuff. Oh, and new, basically, if you want to keep up with Student of the Gun, you read the Liberty Letter. It's got all the good stuff in it, right? Content, content, content. That's content. right. It's got recommended you can't reading. say we didn't tell you. you say, yeah. Because we do tell you. We tell you every single day. but In the Liberty Letter. Yeah, and every single day, every single week. Yeah, but, so I bring this up because, uh, A, if you don't know, get in on it. You just go to studentofthegun.com, sign up. And uh, I added something uh, brand new recently. Because, I don't know, I just got a little bug up my butt, or bug up my bonnet, or whatever the phrase is. And we now have an official Student of the Gun crossword puzzle. Do you like crosswords? Do you like Student of the Gun? You know? Is something good for you to do on your Friday or Saturday morning, depending on when you decide that you want to catch up on all your favorite stuff? You know, you're scrolling through it, and then you sit down, cup of coffee or whatever, and do this official Student of the Gun crossword. It's, it's all about stuff we've done, trivia, you know, our the stuff that we make, so on and so forth. And it's just, you know, 16 prompts, not super long. Nice, just next nice little way to start your morning. There's something in there. There's something to say about these crossword puzzles because I, uh, I had a hard time figuring out a, one of them specifically, one of the prompts. Yep. But there were a couple in there that I was like, hmm, I actually had to think about it. I couldn't just fill it out real quick. Yep. I stumped, you know? I stumped both dad and Jared with at least one. Yes. Dad, I think so you had two, right? If you finish it, Take a screenshot. You can take that screenshot and post it on social media and tag student of the gun. Yeah. yeah and uh, I mentioned it in the thing, but if, if you're like, oh, man, I like crosswords, but I'm bad with words. Don't worry. The answer key will be out the next week. So if you're uh-huh. looking at that and you're like, what could that possibly have been? You got to tune into the next Liberty letter and you'll get the answer key. And then you're like, ah, that makes sense. Ah, uh, There you go. Bingo. Yeah, All right. So you guys want to plug that, Lib- the official Liberty Letter from Student of the Gun. You go to studentofthegun.com, uh, sign up on the little homepage. That you also, when you sign up to, to the weekly newsletter and all that, you also get the seven training tips, right, Jared? Yes. Yes. yes indeed, you do. Seven so, training tips that could save your life. We're just trying to give you stuff. We're just trying to give, give it to you. Just All you need to do is take it from us. Just <sighs> relax and take it. That's just what you know. No, nope, don't phrase it like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jared, or Dad, or whoever's continuing the show, go ahead and continue the show. Yes, we're continuing with the show, and this is when we remind you, if you have questions, we have answers. Go ahead and drop them into the Discord Live. If you're watching the Discord Live, you can do that. Uh, we're we're going to go ahead and move on. Well, before we move on, uh, we had a busy, busy weekend here in the Salt Lake City area, the Salt Lake City Valley area. On Saturday... 
we transplanted, we took starter plants from pots and put them in the ground. And we did about what? 500? Yeah, probably about that. About 500 plants. And these were plants that Alex and Jared and sweet baby Ruth uh, started from seeds. Uh, what? When did you do that? March? Um, yeah, it was... I think yeah, end of March. End I of was March, there too. About six weeks Timelines. ago. Timelines. Yeah, Zach was there for the initial. Season. Oh, Zach was there. Oh, good job, Zach. Thank you. He pushed some seeds in. Yeah. So, wh- what do you call those little those little uh, cookie hockey puck little looking pucks. things? Yeah, they're starters. They're starter pucks. Chocolate marshmallows. Pucks. Chocolate marshmallows. <laughs> we actually found out this year that um, we the 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 environment that we have we don't need those pucks. So we're going to use what we have, and then we're not going to use them anymore. Oh, what are you going to use? We're just the, uh, I think there's like a one by one, one inch by one inch. Maybe it's two inches by two inches, but these little square containers Mm -hmm. that have six squares. Oh. And so you just fill that with the the compost dirt mixture that we make and then put the seed in it. And we found because the seed starters were actually a little bit limiting, and -hmm. that's what caused some of the stuff to die. So, um, yeah. You know what your grandmother used to do? What'd she do? She would start, she, back in the olden days, when we had cardboard egg containers. Uh, Those are for starters. Yeah. So yeah. what she would do is just take the bottom of, a, of an egg, cardboard egg tray, That's smart. fill it with dirt, and then, you know, put one seed in each one yeah. and then water it on the, on the shelf, whatever, on the windowsill. Uh, and then just she takes scissors and just cut them apart. And because it was cardboard, she poke a hole in the bottom of them and just put just the whole put thing the whole in thing the ground. There. Yeah, that's pretty smart. Yeah. Well, I might try that because the uh, what we found the problem was that when with the starter pucks, it doesn't get big enough, and then you have to transplant it or up pot mm. it. I guess it's called. Yeah. And then you have to up pot it. And the, the plants when they're smaller, they get really angry when you move them around. And, mm. and, yeah. Sometimes they die. So yeah. yeah. And so if we just put them in a bigger space immediately, they have more time to establish their roots before we move them into a different pot. And many people are like, well, why are, why are you bothering to do that? Just stick the seeds in the ground. Yeah, the soil here is doesn't really work that way. Well, well not only rocky. that, but the weather, yeah. the weather doesn't work that way. Yes. Uh, we still had frost in May. Yeah. So we had to bring in the plants last night that were sitting on the table waiting to go in our garden beds here. Mm. We had to bring them in last night because it was going to get too cold for them. Oh. They probably would have been fine in the in the uh, the raised beds, but we didn't have them planted yet. Yeah. I was like, dang, I'm glad Alex checked the weather because those suckers would have been Yeah, so we, uh, on Saturday, we spent all day transplanting uh, starter plants into raised beds. And then on Sunday, we start. We spent the whole day. Jared, uh, I just helped a little bit, but Jared spent the whole day creating new raised beds, so we would have even more. And he's like, "Well, how much? How much food do you freaks need? Well, we need all of it." Okay. I don't know if you guys have been paying attention yeah. lately, but all of it is is the amount of food that we need. And so. for those of you that have space to do garden beds, I don't have a big lot here at, at my house. Um, but I've got enough space to do these, the raised garden beds where we have 18, 36, 40, that's 54 plus 18. So about 70 square feet of, of uh, planting raised beds here that we're going to be putting the stuff in. And obviously like we have, I think six tomato plants. We only re- really need two or three for our family. But the reason I brought this up is because if you have extra space to plant an extra tomato plant or two or three or whatever, that is fantastic community outreach. Oh, absolutely. Go to your neighbors and say, hey, we've got extra from our garden here. We grew yeah, this. we grew a ton of go. cucumbers or a ton of tomatoes or a ton of peppers. I tell you what, people love peppers. Yeah. If you can, if you can grow and, and peppers, what I've, I've discovered is that tomatoes and peppers are pretty easy. They're pretty easy plants. Yeah, as long uh, as you don't let the sun bake them. Yeah, as long as you don't let the sun bake them, you got to water them and stuff. But um uh, yeah, uh, there's up here. The hard thing up here is root crops. Root crops are tough in our environment. I don't know about your environment here specifically, Jared, but uh, I, find out I know in Wyoming, root crops are tough. 
And the reason that you use raised beds is a because, well, you don't have to kneel on the ground. Because but, those stupid voles will eat them if you don't. But b uh, because the for a lot of people think, well, I have a I have a backyard. So what I'll do in an emergency, if it ever gets that, if it ever gets serious, just throw some topsoil on the, the ground. And- yeah, I, I'll just I'll just cut out the grass and I'll plant food. I'll plant seeds in where my grass used to be. No, you won't, because that soil is not designed to support plant growth or food growth or whatever. Uh, most and not only that, but uh, so this is something that Jacob pointed out in his uh, grain mills don't poop bread uh episode most city lots most backyards are designed and they're built specifically for water runoff Mm -hmm. not for retention and they're the soil is yeah look look at yours up here uh if it wasn't for sod you'd have nothing yes uh because the you know, we're, we're living at the essentially what used to be a mountain range. Yeah. Uh, and, and the soil is really super depleted and it's really dry and it's really rocky. So the best way for us to do it is to do raised garden beds and just feed the bed, you know, and, and a lot of people, and the reason you want, one of the reasons you want to do that is if you, if you have heavy erosion problems or erosion, you, you don't want the rain washing away all yeah. the good stuff yep. and leaving the rocks and crap behind. So uh, I, I saw a lot of you guys, well, several of you guys have been posting pictures in the discord about chicken coops and raised beds and so forth. And that's fantastic. And I hope more of you are doing that. Matter of fact, I hope all of you are doing that. Uh, I don't know if you've been paying attention to uh, what's going on in the world lately, but here's my real quick down and dirty for you. If you buy anything in a store, it arrives there on a truck. Uh, It doesn't come on the backs of unicorns. It doesn't float in there on on magical wind, solar-powered gliders. It comes in a truck, and that truck is powered by diesel fuel. And diesel fuel is extremely expensive, which means everything that's on the truck, the price of everything on the truck is going to go up well, it's already gone up. It's going to continue to go up and it's going to get higher and it's going to become more scarce. That is the reality of the situation that we're in because we allowed criminals to take over our government. Sorry, if you don't like it, if it makes you uncomfortable, too bad. So uh, one of the things you can do to take control and, you know, when I hear people say, well, if it ever gets that bad, I will blank, blank, blank. I got an idea. How about you do the right thing or a good thing before Mm -hmm. the crisis, before it gets bad? We like to say that. I hear people say, oh, well, you know, if things ever get bad, this is what I'm going to do. And I'm like, well, if that's a good idea, then just do it now. Why don't you start a garden now? Why do you have to? Why do you think you're going to wait until the zombie apocalypse to start a garden? or to get chickens or whatever. Just just do the right thing now. Having self-sufficiency and, and independence in your life is never a bad thing. Self-sufficiency is never a bad thing, whether the economy is great or whether the economy is crap. Self-sufficiency is never a bad thing. Nope. Right. You know what's terrible? Having your own food and not having to rely on someone else. That's terrible. You wouldn't have to. Worry You're about a racist. Shortages. You're an anti-government we racist. Our own food. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's go ahead and move on to the dirt coat finish firearm of the week. It's summertime, some, some summertime. And now is the time to put a summer coat. Summer here, summer there, summer everywhere. Everywhere. That's right. It's like summer teeth. Summer here, summer there. Uh, <laughs> you ever heard a person described as having summer teeth? Yeah. <laughs> uh, she's got, she looks all right, but she's got summer teeth. Summer teeth? Yeah, summer here, summer there. <laughs> 
<laughs> you're mean. You're a racist. You're a sexist homophobe, and I'm not going to listen to you anymore. If you think I'm a racist, sexist homophobe, and you don't want to listen to me anymore, then don't go away. We don't need you in our audience. If you got sand in your vagina and it's all itchy because I said something that hurt your feelings, go away. Go find a bidet and clean it out. But uh, mm-hmm. go away. There's some actually what I, where I went to on the Duracoat website is I went to the military slash LE camo kits. And if you haven't gone there, this is one of those things that's going to make you spend money. <laughs> Because you, you you pop on over and you look, you're like, oh, I want actually one of each. <laughs> I, I want to have one of all of those things is what I want uh, because it's so darn cool. They've got the Afghan desert. They've got the desert storm desert. They've got the Rhodesian, which is so nice that uh, you'll paint it twice. They got the digital, they got the Marine Corps digital, they've got the the urban digital, they've got the essentially their version of what uh, multicam. It there's so, so many. Stuff. Yeah, they, there are so many options. Now, some of you guys might be thinking, I don't know if I could do that. Well, if you don't know what your skill level is. This is what my advice to you pick a three color pattern. Well, I don't care which one, just pick a three color pattern and practice, do a practice gun with three colors. It's really not that hard if you can, if you pay attention and read directions, if you have the capacity and the if you have the mental discipline to make yourself read directions, uh, for instance, well, that's a four color, but um, there's the the basic woodland pattern, which uh, is pretty easy. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, there, there are several patterns that are that are either two or three colors. There's some of them that are five and six colors. But if you want to practice, if it's your first time or if it's your first time doing a Duracoat camouflage pattern and you're, you're a little trepidatious, you're feeling a little trepidatious, you're like, oh, that looks so cool, but I'm afraid if I do it, I'll screw it up and it'll look terrible. Calm down. Practice. You know, get one of their three color kits. Like, for instance, the Russian Army camo has three colors. It comes with a template and you can do it. So. That, that would be my recommendation to you guys. If you're out there, you're looking for a cool summer camo, uh, whether it's, you know, like a, a Rhodesian or whether it's woodland or desert or whatever, get order one of the three color kits because it's not that. I mean, you only have to do three layers, right? It's not that complicated. And uh, I think you'll be impressed with the results. If you can. Like I said, the caveat is you actually have to be able to pay attention and follow directions. If you're one of those guys out there, you're like, oh, well, you lost me at follow directions. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. You lost me at follow directions. So you're, you're a racist, bigoted, homophobe because you want me to follow directions. But if you can follow directions, uh, order one of their kits, one of their three color kits. And remember, what's the most important part of a project, Jared? The prep, the prep. Yeah, that's right. The prep is the most important part. You know, the more stuff I build, the more I realize that that's true pretty much universally. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a universal truth that if you spend more time prepping, then you're going to spend less time doing the fixing portion. The the meat of the job is generally prepping. Yeah. Well, look at what you did yesterday with the with the the flower bed designs or the garden designs. Yeah. It's like we spent probably 75% of the day prepping the space and then 25% actually building the things. Oh, and, and, uh, mad props to Zachary. Yes. Mad props. Zach gets what I do. 
mad props you, for uh, prepping the ground. Yeah, you prepped the ground. For oh, us. yeah, that. It yeah, Zach prepped the ground yeah, the so best. we could put the garden beds on it. So good. I'm glad you guys want to give well. totally crazy, insane, mad props to Zachary. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you. You're well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. Yes, indeed. All right. Let's uh, if you guys want to be a, a mad, crazy Duracoder, uh, go to studentofthegun.com slash Duracoat or just open the show notes and click, click, click. And if you click it, then it will come. <laughs> if you click it, it will arrive. How's that sound? All right. All right. Thank you to our friends at SDS Imports, Sierra Delta, Sierra Imports. And I, I got a, a teaser for you guys. If you follow us on socialist media, if you follow our socialist media, whether it's the uh, fascist book uh, or the Instagram image, if you follow those, you'll see that I posted a couple of photos last week of a new VP12 a VP-12 semi-automatic magazine-fed shotgun, and it is a Kalashnikov design. And let me tell you what, uh, I'm really so far impressed. Now, I just got this gun in my hands literally right before we came over here to, it was the day before we came to Salt Lake City. Uh, I got the gun, but the furniture looks good. It has an, essentially, it looks like a, an AK-74 style stock. It has a, uh, uh, I can see that what they did with the pistol grip is they took the U.S. Palm pistol grip and completely stole it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're like, that looks good. Let's make one just like that. But the, uh, the barrel is, I think it's like 18 and three quarters or something like that. Oh, uh, because American shotguns have to be a minimum of 18 because if it's 17, then the world will end yeah. and everyone will die. That makes them more lethal. You yeah. Know yeah. Yeah. So, but it, it has the, 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 the standard basic length. It's not too long. A lot, a lot of the magazine fed Kalashnikov style guns, they were putting 20 inch barrels on them or 21 inch or 22 inch barrels on them. And they were, they seem, you know, they're just, overly long this one uh it's got ak style furniture it functions like an ak as an ak safety on it now the charging handle is on the other side of the gun it's on the left side uh which is actually kind of cool so if you're a righty you just reach up whack it. uh it's magazine fed it has polymer furniture and uh it's a slick looking gun uh, i'm looking forward to doing a complete review for you guys uh, but that's something brand new from SDS Imports. So if you haven't checked out their websiteage here lately, uh, go over to SDS Sierra Delta Sam Imports dot com. And uh, that is the new hotness. That is the new hotness. So ch -ch 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 check it out. Check it out. So. All right. Moving on. Moving on to uh, High Point Firearms. And we, I don't know if there's anything new to talk about with High Point. Uh, congratulations to Kevin for picking up a, a Yeet Cannon. I saw that recently. So good job. Good job. And as you experiment with cans on that, uh, you're, you're going to find some interesting stuff. You're going to find some interesting stuff, Kevin. That's all I'm going to say is... Uh, Start experimenting, and you're going to discover some interesting things. <laughs> fun. Yes. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. All right. What else do we need to talk about? Let me see. Let me catch up to my show notes. I don't need to be in the Duracoat thing anymore or the SDS thing anymore. All right. Now is the time that you hush your mouth and open up both your ears and listen louder. Attention, new listeners. We produced a complimentary oh, yeah. online training course called Seven Training Tips That Could Save Your Life. Get instant access by joining the Student Lounge for free at studentofthegun.com. Do you watch Student of the Gun TV, read the blog, and follow us on Facebook? If you answered no to any of these questions, you are wrong. But 
you can easily fix yourself. Go to studentofthegun.com to find everything SOTG. All right. This is the time that we remind you, <clears throat> excuse me, we remind you that if you're going to be attending the NRA annual meetings, which is coming up in just two weeks, uh, if you're going to attend the annual the NRA annual meeting in Houston, Texas, it's Houston, right? Yeah. Uh, you should swing by the SDS Imports booth because you could win. Yeah, so you could win a PX9 Generation 3 one-of-a-kind pistol with the uh, that has the night fission night fission that's the accurate night uh, sights from night fission uh on it it's going to be it's got a, a stainless steel slide and it's, it's cool but uh, they're giving that away to one lucky winner so if you're going to be at the nra annual meetings make sure that you go by the sds import booth and tell them that student of the gun sent you well if you're going to be there go by duracoat and SDS Imports, and High Point, and Brownells, and Crossbreed, and tell them all that Student of the Gun sent you. That would be righteous. All right, it's time for Brownells Bullet Points, brought to you by Brownells. Bing, bang, boom. All right. I recently, it was about a week or so ago, I saw, you know, how people like to post things on the socialist media, like, what's the best? What's better for? And it was someone who was a, a, an influencer, an influencer, did a video and they said, what's better for bears, 10 millimeter or 44 magnum? Yes, is the answer. Yes, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And I thought that this story, thanks to Doug Arnold for sharing it, uh, this story would be a good way for us to dive into that conversation about what is the best caliber for bears. Bears. So beats, beats and Battlestar, Battlestar Galactica. Galactica. That's right. You are not going to shoot the Battlestar Galactica, but we are potentially going to shoot bears because bears are predators and they will eat you bears. and make you die. No, they won't. That's just left, right. That's right wing Trumpist propaganda. Okay. Uh, Jared, you want to dive into the story here? It's a pretty new story. Yes, it's from my Wabish Valley. It's U.S. Army soldier killed in bear attack during training exercise. This is crazy. Yeah, a U.S. Army soldier stationed at a base in Alaska died after being injured by a bear on Tuesday. The Alaskans are making fun of me for the way I said that name. The soldiers, the soldier who was stationed at Joint Base uh, Elmendorf Richardson was participating in a training exercise on, in Eagle River Anchorage with a small group of soldiers, according to a news release. Officials at the base did not say if any trainees had sustained injuries. Any other trainees? Yeah. Yeah. We know one did. Yeah. Because he, he's dead. The yeah. name of the deceased soldier was being held until next of kin was notified. Wildlife troopers from Alaska's Department of Public Safety were dispatched to locate the bear. The area has also been closed off to the public. Joint Base Elmer Richardson will provide additional details as they become available. So that's not a lot to go on, but here's what we know. Now, a lot of kids out there in the audience will be saying that doesn't make any sense. They're soldiers, right? Yeah. How does a soldier get killed by a bear? Couldn't they shoot it? And this is the reality that I'm going to hip you guys to. The U.S. Army, the military in general, but the U.S. Army has a really bad habit of not letting or allowing their people to have live ammunition. They might make them carry the guns around, you know, but live ammunition is what, Jared? 
It's dangerous. It's too dangerous. It's too dangerous. They could hurt. What if they had a negligent discharge and hurt themselves or someone else? You say, but Paul, this is the year 2020. Certainly, we're no longer operating under institutionalized stupidity where we don't trust soldiers with live ammo. And I would say to you, <laughs> right. Do you think they're getting it's getting better in the army? Mm -hmm. You think it's getting people are. Yeah. Uh huh. No, no. What they probably what the modern U.S. Army probably expected the soldiers to do was to dialogue with the bear and sit down and talk about its gender identity. You know, did now that's something we don't know from this story. Did the soldier attempt to dialogue with the bear? And did gender identity come up at any point in time? And did the bear use the correct pronoun? Because if the bear didn't use the correct pronoun, then then that's a, a bigoted, homophobic, a big, big, bigoted, sexist bear. bear. And then they're, you know, they're going to have to kill it. But if they find out, maybe the soldier mispronounced the bear. We don't know that they, he might have the soldier might have used the incorrect pronoun when describing the bear and the bear was thereby justified in killing him or her. It doesn't say him or her. It, it could have been a a, a, a chick, right? Because um, it says has not been identified uh, pending next to kin. You're like, how can you make fun, Paul? I'm not making fun. This is where we are in the world. OK, Alaska. People who live in Alaska, all of our Alaska listeners are going, uh, duh. We have large predatory animals that roam around freely. Nah. And we who live in Alaska know, duh, you don't go out into the woods or down by the river without a rifle hmm. because there are large predatory animals that will eat you. That's just too bad. But you see, the army doesn't take that kind of stuff into consideration. You can't just let soldiers have live ammunition for their guns. Don't you understand how dangerous that is? Well, for one soldier who's no longer alive, yeah, it's super dangerous. You say, well, well, what was they supposed to do? And this is when people say, well, it wouldn't have mattered because the M4 is a 5.56 and you can't stop a bear with a 5.56. You can't. How, tell me why you can't. I'm not talking about the ethics of one shot kill hunting. I'm talking about making a predatory animal stop trying to kill you. You see, if I have a firearm that contains 10, 12, 15, 28, 32 rounds, I'm going to use the amount of rounds that I need until the predatory animal stops trying to kill me. It might be two, might be five, might be 10. I don't know. I don't know. It's not now, your decision. It's when it comes to Calibre, that's right. The bear gets, and the bear gets a vote. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we learned from Ed Morales. It's like, you have all these wonderful plans, but you have to understand that the bad guy, the predator gets a vote. And in this case, the, the bear gets a vote. 44 Magnum. All right. Why does the 44 Magnum exist? Because the uh, after the FBI Miami shootout, yeah. they developed that cartridge because they needed a more powerful one with more stopping power so that. Stop. You're, you're going to confuse the audience. You're, you're doing your. I'm jumping forward to the show. Yeah. And what's going to happen is people are going to say, I was listening to a student. I got a nice said that the 44 Magnum was developed and, and they're stupid. I'm writing a letter. Please, please do that. Go tell someone's, all your friends. Someone's already writing a letter. You are an idiot. No. Uh, the 44 Magnum exists. It, we have it today because of these things called bears. For, for aminals for bears yeah because i'm gonna give you guys a little bit of a history lesson now um oh uh, let me i'm gonna all right i'm gonna look it up so that i can I'll, I'll i won't give my opinion i will give the opinion of 
the well, I don't know the facts on the internet, which I might have just screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> so Elmer Keith, there was a gentleman. His name was Elmer Keith. Well, so far it's factual. And Elmer so, Keith, we'll see where it goes. Uh, um, in, in addition to being a cowboy, uh, it was a was a guide. He was a fishing guide. He was a fly, and he was a hunting guide. And he spent most of his time in Idaho. Not all of it, but a lot. And uh, in the mountains. And Elmer Keith knew that when he went out to fly fish or hunt whitetail or whatever, or, or mule deer, I'm not sure what's, what's most prevalent in Idaho, that he was going to need something as bear defense. So what Elmer would do is at the time he was taking the 44 special cartridge and he was hand loading it super hot. He was hand loading it to the point where the manufacturers would be like, hey, do us a favor and don't do that. <laughs> Just, and don't do that. He's like, yeah, but you don't understand. Well, I, I need, <laughs> you know, if I'm facing, if I'm all on the side of a mountain and a grizzly decides, you're going to be my lunch, I want to something to stop it. So he uh, was, was making, he was loading the 44 special super hot. And this, and this is, this is not, uh, unknown. Most people who in my generation know this, well, he got with Remington and he got with Remington ammunition and he said, why don't you guys make a 44 that is, it's not, you know, that you can shoot really hot, but it won't blow the gun up. Right. And they said, all right, we're going to do that. And they created a cartridge called the 44 Magnum, and it was born in 1955. The 44 Magnum was the brainchild of Elmer Keith, and the whole reason that it was developed, that it came about, we, was because of predatory bear attacks. So we've known this. We've had this information for 50, 60, 70 years. We've known. So why are people 70 years after the, in, after the introduction of the 44 Magnum going out into the Alaska wilderness without guns or loaded guns? Well, you don't know. it. They might have had loaded guns and, and the bear might have attacked them and killed them anyway. Well, I'm thinking if they wouldn't have to locate the bear because in the story, it says they're trying to find yeah, it. It's, find it, it's yeah. at large. Yeah, there's a bear at large. If the troopers, if the soldiers had loaded rifles, they wouldn't be looking for the bear because you know why? It's right there. They would they have would, found the bear. They would have said person. Well, it, it's there. It is. See, yeah. it has holes in it. Uh, and now it's not eating anyone. But we don't do that in our modern world. We, we take the lessons of the past. And we ignore them because we have cell phones. I'm sure that all the soldiers in the field probably had their phones on them. You know, they didn't have loaded rifles, but they had their phones mm -hmm. and they probably had a printout from the, the director of the army about how to, you know, miss, be sure now they didn't misgender anybody. You know, it does say they, they that, probably have pocket cards. Yeah, that to, you know, it does say here that newcomers are trained in bear safety and instructed to travel in groups. Oh, this is for the general public. <laughs> Make noise and carry bear deterrent during exercises. Uh, public affairs specialists explained in 2015 that the area where the facility is located is home to a wild variety of or a wide variety of wildlife, including both brown and black bear. Oh, you, that's just parent. That the whole bear attack thing is just is just right wing MAGA Trumpist propaganda. That doesn't actually happen. Uh, so should you carry a forty four Magnum? Should you carry a ten millimeter? Should you carry forty five ACP? Yes. Uh, yes, carry any of those. Uh, should you carry a nine millimeter? Sure, why not? There was a we we've shared the story before. I'm not going to bore you guys with the details about a 
a, uh, a guide who had a Smith and Wesson nine millimeter pistol, uh, and was, they were going on the way back to the seaplane, I guess it was. And when a bear, a brown bear came out of the woods and he's like, hi, I'm going to kill all of you essentially. And, uh, the dude shot him with the nine millimeter. He pointed it at his head and like kept pressing the trigger until the bear stopped trying to kill him. And it was a nine mil. If you want to carry a 44 Magnum, I would say fantastic. Here's the deal though. American men, the pistol in and of itself is not a magic talisman. You need to shoot it and practice with it and have confidence with it because you're probably going to be a little hyped up and a little nervous as the bear is attacking you or your best buddy. That's not the time to wonder, am I going to be able to make this machine work? If you're not willing to shoot a hundred rounds of 44 Magnum to practice in practice, you're like, that's too expensive. It's too hard kicking. I'm not going to do that. Then fine. Then don't buy it. If you're not willing to practice and train with it, don't buy it. If you think oh, I'll just buy it and I'll carry it just in case you're going to just die. Uh, if the 10 millimeter 10 millimeters, still a, a, a bark and son of a gun, but, uh, from the, the Glock 20, the Glock 20, yeah, the Glock 20 is a 10 millimeter. Uh, you'll get, you'll start out with 15 rounds as opposed to six in a normal 44 Magnum. So if that makes you more comfortable, then awesome. Rock on carry that. If you want to carry a Glock 21 or in 45 ACP, then you get start out with 13 plus one, right? Uh, but the, the caliber really isn't so important as the training and the confidence that you have in yourself and in your gun. If you don't have train, if you don't have confidence, uh, if you don't believe you could pull that gun out and, and put rounds on target as a bear is bearing down on you uh, or a friend of yours or whatever, then you better buy a gun that you could shoot uh, and practice with. So a lot of people have the, you know, guys out there, they're like, well, you know, it's, it's really the ammo is really expensive and uh, it's a hard kick. And so I don't shoot it a lot. I don't shoot it, you know, that much because it's expensive and, and blah, blah. Then, then don't buy it. Uh, if your thought process is why well, I can't, I can't do that because the ammo is too expensive. You're better off buying a nine mil a Glock 17 and shooting 500 to a thousand rounds through that gun and having supreme confidence than a 10 mil that you only bought one box of ammo for. Yeah. Uh, it's not magic. It's not magic kids. So if you go to Brownells, they have a variety of stuff right now. Unfortunately, we're still dealing with shortages because of the, well, the lunacy in our world, but they do have some 44 mag. I will say this, that they have the, the Underwood ammo. And then let's check out, see if black, if they have the black Hills in stock. Um, when it comes to bears, you're going to want to put the bullets deep into them. Uh, you don't want bullets that are going to explode on the surface. Uh, you want bullets to go deep in and do damage to the brain and the heart and all that stuff. So, uh, the black Hills honey badger ammunition is designed with a, uh, with a bullet, a projectile that will penetrate deeply, but it does not need to expand to do damage. It's a non-expanding bullet that performs like an expanding bullet. You say, what? Yeah, uh, you heard me. You heard me. Don't pretend like you didn't. They have it in 9 mil. They have it in 40, uh, 45. They have it in 44 Magnum. Uh, check those guys out if you can't get it from Brownells. The great thing about Brownells is they'll send, they will sell you a single box of Black Hills ammunition. Uh, you don't have to buy a case. Uh, if you just want to buy one box, you can buy one box of ammunition from Brownells. So there you go. And All right. Go to the show notes. We will have links directly to the ammo we yes. just talked about. Yes. All right. Moving on, moving on, moving on. That's your brown nose bullet points for the day. Calibers for bears. Uh, we've got a, a time for, well, it's time for me to be quiet and let Zach talk for a second. ShopSOTG.com is the perfect place to go if you are a student of the gun. 
Whether you want to expand your brain, increase your marksmanship, or help keep your family safe. All that, plus the Pimp Hand brands that you love. ShopSOTG.com has almost anything that an American patriot would want. Education, enlightenment, and entertainment, and we're open 24-7. Check out ShopSOTG.com today and see for yourself. That's right. See for yourself, freaks. Don't take my word for it. Uh, all right. So we're going to move on now to our Student of the Gun homeroom. Student of the Gun homeroom is brought to you every week by our good buddies at Crossbreed Holsters. Yes, and uh, this is actually a good tie-in to the last story. Uh, one of the holster systems that they make uh, at Crossbreed is called a chest rig. They have a very, very well-made chest rig, and that chest rig, you can get it for a variety of firearms. Uh, let, me, let me go ahead and look real, real quick. Manufacturer. So you can get a chest rig for a 1911 for the various Beretta models, for the Glock models, for Kimber, Ruger, Sig, Smith. Uh, you can choose from the Smith & Wesson Model 29 uh, if you want, if you so desire. You can choose from the Glock Model 21 or 20. So uh, if you were, you say, okay, I got a bear gun and I'm going to wear it in the woods because I don't want a bear to eat me. Uh, you might want to consider a chest rig because it puts the gun nice and high up on your chest. And if you're wearing packs and, and all kinds of, you know, if you're hiking or whatever, often the standard hip carry is not really going to work for you. And if you're an appendix guy, that's great, but I'm guessing you're not going to wear a Glock 20 as an appendix gun. You know, I, I know live your life the way you yeah. want to live it. But I'm kind of I'm guessing that's probably not what you're going to do. So uh, and if you do that, if you say, OK, I, I believe you, Paul, I trust you. I'm going to go over to a Crossbreed Holsters. I'm going to order one of these things of which you speak. Make sure that you're using the promotional code SOTG, because when you use the promotional code SOTG, you're going to save some cash, some moolah, and you're going to get a good quality holster and you're going to be happy about it. So there you go. All right. Um, the primary theme of the student of the gun homeroom, right? Crossbreed is being dangerous on demand. That's why Madison rising dangerous is a theme music. We've got a story here just happened. This just broke. I don't know if it was a day ago. Uh, no, it actually broke today uh, as we're recording this happened. And it's a story out of California, but the reporting agency is the New York Post dot com. It says pastor congregation, hogtied California gunman with extension cord during church shooting. The pop ups are awesome on this thing. The gunman who killed one and injured five others in a California church Sunday was tackled by a heroic retired pastor. Then he was subdued by elderly parishioners who hogtied his legs and wrangled away his two handguns. The gunman, so far only identified as an Asian man in his 60s, burst into Irvine Taiwanese Presbyterian Church in Laguna Woods during a luncheon honoring its former longtime pastor, Billy Chang. When the killer paused to reload, Chang hit him on the head with a chair while others moved quickly to grab his gun. I'm just wondering if it was a light chair, like a five guys. Yeah, how like much, well, a five guys chair. How fast was the chair moving? Mm. It, it could have been like a WWE deal where they flattened out the folding chair and, and smashed him with it. All are good options, to be fair. All good options, yeah. They held him down and hogtied his legs with extension cords. Uh, this is a quote from Orange County under sheriff. What is an under sheriff? He's uh, less than a sheriff, not quite a sheriff. Okay. Jeff Halleck. He said that group of churchgoers displayed what we believe is exceptional heroism and bravery in intervening to stop the suspect. Mm. So, all right, this is great and all, but why didn't somebody shoot this guy dead right there? Oh, because it's California. 
and you're not allowed. You see, in California, only bad people are allowed to carry guns. Good people are not. And then after, this is what we know about California. If and in, look, if you look at the photos uh, of the scene here, Jared. So what happens is a bad person with a gun goes and kills innocent good people who don't have guns because they're not allowed by their masters in Sacramento. The good people aren't allowed to have guns. So after that all happens, then we send out members of the state. We send out state employees that have guns, but who are not ever there when the bad guy shows up and we have them walk around and stand around so that when the reporters get there, the reporters can take photos of the state employees of the armed state employees as they walk around. Now, the armed state employees that show up afterwards aren't really doing anything productive. They're just there. It's over. The incident is finished. The, the person's either been arrested or, or killed or got away or whatever. But we send the the armed state employees out in their body armor in there, you know, and we have them stand on the corner so that the reporters who show up will take pictures of them and they'll post those pictures. And then you can say, well, I feel warm and fuzzy inside now because because the look, look, the police are there. And, and the, the state cares. No, they don't. The state doesn't care. The government doesn't care. In California, the government looks at you, the peasant, and you have two things to do. Pay your taxes and die. That's what the, the state needs from you. They need you to pay your taxes and die. They don't want you to defend yourself with a firearm. They don't want you to have the ability to be dangerous on demand. Because in California, if you're a lunatic, if you're a psycho and you want to kill people, you know that the people inside are all disarmed because they're the good people and they obey the rules. And the rule says that they're not allowed to have guns. Oh, I, I, you want to know what an undersheriff is, Jared? Yes. There's a picture of an undersheriff here. And the undersheriff is only a lieutenant general. Oh, he's only three stars. Yeah, he only gets he's only allowed to wear three stars on his collar. Four. Um, whereas the uh, the sheriff is actually a general. We've we've lost our minds in America. They've literally they're so arrogant. They're so impressed with themselves. What are you talking about, Paul? If you don't know. I mean, you obviously don't pay attention, but here's the deal. Can I tell you the deal? No. In the United States of America, I was, I, I wore, I got the, you guys know, I, I got t-shirt and I went there, did that, saw the elephant, got the t-shirt. Um, up until, I don't know when it was, maybe it was after 9-11 that all these sheriffs and chiefs decided to like declare themselves king of the world or whatever. Oh. Uh, when I was coming up, when I was a police officer, if you were a chief of police, the the emblem that you wore on your collar to indicate that you were the police chief was an eagle, right? A spread eagle. <laughs> ah. a, 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 and in the United States Army and then also the Marine Corps and also in the Air Force, the eagle is the colonel symbol because the cops they they buy their emblems to say they buy the same ones at the military bus. So if you were a chief of police, you were authorized to wear the eagle on your collar. Now, if you were the sheriff of a county, if you were an elected sheriff, now the sheriff is above the chief of police. You know why? Because the sheriff's elected. Because they're elected. The sheriff, see, the chief of police is nominated and appointed by a mayor and a city council. The people have no say. You as a as an individual citizen have no say in who the chief of your chief of police of your city is. Well, you could pressure them. Well, I mean, you mayor, could pressure them, but as long as they listen to their constituents. But when it comes to the sheriff, that person is elected by the constituency. Yep. So 
the sheriff would wear a single five pointed star on his collar to indicate that he is the sheriff of the county. But we're so far down the the psycho rabbit hole now. I, I'm what would the uses. What would the usefulness be between adding multiple stars to different ranks and like the sheriff's Arians. There's Arians. no other use. See, the under sheriff would normally an under sheriff or a um, they're called under sheriffs there. They're called the uh, they're called the chief deputy in in the east, like in Ohio. You have a sheriff. And then the guy, the like the vice president is the chief deputy and the chief deputy is kind of the he's the day to day guy. The sheriff doesn't every day in most county. They don't go out and they don't talk to the deputies and they don't organize scheduling and stuff like that. They hire a chief deputy and the chief deputy makes sure the scheduling is taken care of. And, and he does the disciplinary stuff and da, da, da. Um, talks to the media. Yeah. Talks to the media. And tells them how brave these unarmed victims were. These unarmed victims in this church were super brave. So one of the things that I'm confused about is let's let me get back up to the quotes. Released. Here it goes. It says this is from the under sheriff. He says they undoubtedly prevented additional injuries and fatalities. I think it's safe to say that had people not intervened, it could have been much worse. Okay, so we have law enforcement officials admitting that people are the first solution to the problem. Mm -hmm. That the, the people on we, scene. Why do we also have law enforcement officials limiting those people's ability to be the solution? You mean like carry guns? Because we don't want people taking the law into their own hands. That's why we have 911. That's why. No, yeah, they're, they're right complete and total says, hypocrites. Right here, it says, I think it's safe to say that had people not intervened, it could have been much worse. Well, it's OK if they intervene empty handed. We don't want them intervening with a gun because you have to understand in California, the government has a monopoly on violence and they want that monopoly on violence. So if you peasants want to defend yourselves empty handed, we will applaud you. If you peasants want to defend yourself with guns, no way you are not allowed. What's the purpose of the dog? Uh, he's, he's smelling the flowers. If they had the, the dude hog tied. What's the purpose of bringing dogs? Oh, well, they, they got to bring all their stuff out. They didn't. I mean, they got all dressed up, man. They, they got all dressed up in their in their super cool, expensive, you know, uniforms and they, they got to go out get their pictures taken by the media. Wow. You're kind of a, you're kind of a, a Debbie downer there, Paul. No, I'm calling it out. I'm calling it out. This, this freaking, this dog and pony show, this, this idiot display where after somebody goes schizo and commits a murder and then they, they send out the troops to stand around on the corner. So the media can take their pictures like, look at these, these this mustachioed dude with the classic California sheriff deputy mustache. Oh, um, oh that's that's a, the cop stash. If you go down the bottom there, the two guys, one who was looking at the camera. Oh, and the, yeah. yeah, that's the classic California cop stash. Uh, and good for him for for keeping it up. They're doing nothing. They're just sucking up oxygen. The, the guy's already gone. He's in custody. He's gone. They, they rolled out behind them. They rolled out the, the, uh, the, the uh, command vehicle. That's a, a SWAT command vehicle that's behind them there. Why? What, what? It's over. By the time they showed up, it was over. What's the purpose of having a SWAT command vehicle show up? Weird flex, bro. Yeah. So we at student of the gun have been promoting a church security program for several years now. It's called the Legion of Michael. And, and you can go to, it's a, it's a really right different right now. Yeah. Legion of Michael.com right this moment. And uh, if you go there, you can join the VIP waiting list, sign up for the waiting yep. list. So as soon as uh, the next semester is open, you will be informed. 
if and- for some reason you're not aware of the Legion of Michael podcast, there is a podcast. And if you go to legionmichael.com, there's a direct link to it. There's also a book. It's called Legion of Michael Defending the Flock. And it's available right now at shopsotg.com. So I would rather, he's like, what's the point of all this? this? I would rather that the people, that the good people be armed and trained and prepared to defend themselves uh, and that the state get out of their way and let them do that. But in California, that's not going to happen because the people of California have willingly allowed themselves to become the slaves of their masters in Sacramento. And that's just the way it's going to be. And what's sad to me is that there are people in California who work for the state and wear polyester uniforms who think that's the way it should be. That's right. I get to carry guns, but you don't because you're a peasant and I'm not. There you go. All right. Remember, we, uh, Zach, do you know which episode it was that we talked about the uh, government crack pipes, the the crack pipes from the uh, that, that they were going to buy these safe smoking kits? Uh, it's been a couple months. Yeah, it hasn't been that long. It was earlier this year. It wasn't last year. Oh, no, no. It's it's been within the last couple of months. Yeah. But uh, so when this initially came out, they're like, we're going to fund safe smoking kits for people who use crack. And well, oh, here we go. It was it was only two months ago. It was episode one, one, two, five safe smoking kits, right? Safe smoking kits. Uh, And they sent out the orange woman, that, that freaking lying Chucky doll. And She's like, these Republicans are all racist and mean and evil. And and there are no the the idea that there would be crack pipes in these safe smoking kits is exact is ludicrous. And then, of course, when we shared the stories, the the uh, the willing sycophants in socialist media, the the Ministry of Truth, they they got out and they're like, Oh, yeah, this story from this this Republican who says, you know, there's that's that's we fact checked that and we shut it down and we closed it and blah, blah, blah. So they went ahead and uh, used. Well, the reason that they were getting all excited about this and the reason that Republican congressmen were calling them out is because we were going to give U.S. government funding to these city organizations, these who create the safe smoking kits, right? And rightfully so, someone stopped and said, um, there should we first of all, the idea that we're going to enable people, we're going to make it easier for them to become drug addicts is insane. And the idea that we would take taxpayer money and make clean, safe smoking kits because people who do drugs often get sick and they spread diseases amongst each other. Jerry, do you have the story open? Go ahead and open up the Washington Free Beacon story and look at some of these kits, these safe smoking kits that have been purchased and then hand it out to drug addicts to make things safe. Heart, they're harm reduction kits. We have, because if we know anything about crack smokers, it's how concerned they are about hygiene and health. I mean, look uh, at this. This one's from the freebeacon.com. It says, yes, safe smoking kits include free crack pipes. Mm-hmm. We know because we got them. Yeah. So these guys, these reporters, they're like, okay, we'll play your silly little game. So they signed up. What's this black, uh, the brown thing? And they, they got these kits, these safe smoking kits. Zach, can you display this picture? Listen to this. And this sure thing. thing. Yes. What is this brown thing? Uh, that's a pipe. 
I thought this was. Well, like, I don't know. I don't know. What is that brown thing? I don't know what the brown thing That's is. a pipe above it. The crack pipe is. I don't know. I don't do top. crack, so I'm not really sure how that works. Um, oh, but they have alcohol wipes. Dude, you, you like the one from Richmond, what? Richmond, Virginia. It's got a little baby spoon, little mini spoon. It's got a little fake razor. It's got a it's got a, a playing card so you can cut. Yeah, yeah. Your so, drugs. So, some on of it. these, you look at them, and you go, well, "What is that?" Uh, I'm putting the picture up now. But some of these, you look at it, and you like squint and go, "Like, what the hell is that?" But no, some of these are like, "No, no, that is a crack pipe." I've seen enough of them on Wish.com. They're absolutely crack pipes. I've seen enough of them on Wish.com. That's. I want to know what these brown things are. Is it Chewbacca? The little tube-looking yeah. things. Yeah, I don't know what pipes are distributed in safe smoking kits up and down the East Coast, raising questions about the Biden administration's assertion that a multi-million dollar harm reduction grant program would not funnel taxpayer dollars to drug paraphernalia. The fu- they just straight applied. I got to say, just, the, New yeah, York they, they one, just, the New York one's definitely the laziest. It's a pipe, a thingy, and a couple, what is that, like cleaning things? No, that's that's the, the uh, you, you put that. Which here's here's what I know. You take the the little filter thing, right? The little green and you thing? shove it. You take the dowel and you shove it into the glass pipe. Mm-hmm. Then you put the crack rock in it, and then you light it. See, you don't want that. You don't want to suck the crack rock into your mouth. What's the yeah. steel wool for? To, to clean to, it. You, to, they 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 suck through it. The steel wool. Uh, Maybe I just need to go smoke some cracks. So yeah, you need to. This. You like you need to go down to your local cracks. Look, this is insane. The findings are the result of the Washington Free Beacon visits to five harm re- um, harm reduction organizations and calls to over two dozen more. In fact, every organization we visited, facilities in Boston, New York City, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, and Richmond, Virginia, included crack pipes in the kits. The kits became the subject of national attention in the wake of a Free Beacon report in February indicating that a $30 million harm reduction program was set to fund the distribution of free crack bites in safe smoking kits. Pressured on the matter in February 9th press briefing, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki issued a full-throated detail. I mean, denial. Uh, it says they were never part of the kit. It was inaccurate reporting, Psaki said of the pipes. Mm-hmm. A safe smoking kit may contain alcohol swabs, lip balm, and other materials to promote hygiene and reduce the transmission of diseases. Right. While the contents of safe smoking kits vary from one organization to another, and while those from some organizations may not contain crack pipes, all of the organizations we visited make crack pipes as well as paraphernalia for the use of heroin, cocaine, and crystal methamphetamine, readily available without requiring or offering rehabilitation services, suggesting that pipes are included in many, if not most, of the kits distributed across the country. All of the centers we visited are run by health-focused nonprofits and government agencies, the types of groups eligible to receive funding starting this month from the Biden administration's $30 million grant program. Yeah. So the major, it looks like at least five of the major cities, New York, I don't know if Richmond's a major city, but New York. Did you see there's a program called HIPS? No. Where is that one? It's... um. It says, uh, what, which kind do you want, a volunteer asked from the smoking kit. And below it says, the harm reduction center goes by HIPS, which formally stood for helping individual prostitutes survive. Where is this? <laughs> it's right above the Richmond title. Right above the, it says, Oh, they, I thought that was the end of the article. No, no. Wow, this is a really long article. I yeah. Guess about half of it. They, but they changed the name HIPS from Helping Individual Prostitutes <laughs> to, they altered it to honoring, honoring Individual Power and Strength. So we're going to honor your individual power and strength by giving you a free drug smoking kit. What? How does that work? How do you honor someone's power? And uh, you you're so strong and powerful. We're so proud of you. Here's a free crack smoking kit. Because we don't want you to to use a dirty drug kit. Shouldn't they 
want them to not do these drugs. But real well, quick, I just want to pass off. We are at over an hour now. We don't, okay. need, we don't need to wrap up. I'm just letting you know. All right. Thank you. Uh, so the long story short is, congratulations, America. You were lied to again. And if you recall, it's only been two months. The socialist media, the 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 Zuckerbergs and the and the freaking uh, he wasn't he's not involved anymore. But the Dorseys and so forth, those guys, uh, when when Republican senators, Republican congressmen got really uh, offended and upset, and they're like, you you cannot spend taxpayer money on you can't take taxpayer grant money and give it to people to buy crack pipes they're like that's not what we're doing you're a liar and that's you are misrepresenting this wonderful program no they weren't they were right on but because of the cabal that we have right now the media cabal the organized crime that is washington dc the mainstream media and socialist media they're all working together as organized crime to lie to you and me and all of us. So if you try and spread the truth, they will censor it. They will hide it. They will throttle it. And then they'll send out their their paid liars to say that you're wrong. Oh, you're you're misinterpreting that. No, they were interpreting it exactly correctly. This is it's. It's beyond the pale. I don't even know. And the fact that the U.S. federal government will look at you with their hand out and say, give us money and you'd better give us the amount of money we want and you better not shortchange us because if you do, we're going to find you and we're going to arrest you and we're going to take your property and we're going to guarantee your wages because we need your money. So we can give people free crack pipes. Didn't that make you feel good? When you go to the gas station and it costs you $57 to fill up your tank, doesn't it make you feel good knowing that your tax money is going to give drug users free paraphernalia? Make you feel good. Makes you make you feel great. To make you feel good that your tax money, while you're paying $5.90 for a dozen eggs, if you can find them, that your tax money is going to Planned Parenthood to murder innocent, innocent babies, make you feel good. Should. Oh, yeah. All right. Let's go ahead and jump into the last subject. I mentioned at the very beginning that last week we talked about the Miami firefight lessons learned. And we specifically talked about this book here that I have in my hand. It's called Miami Firefight, Five Minutes to Change the Bureau by Ed Morales, Edmundo Morales, U.S. Uh, well, he was a FBI. He's FBI retired, right? He essentially uh, there were, you know, a couple of guys, a few guys that did, did really well. But uh, Ed was the guy who uh, put his huevos in a wheelbarrow and ended this firefight. So we shared that with the world. And. Of course, not um, not surprisingly, people jumped in and they're like, well, yeah, that's it was the FBI firefight that it, that caused the militarization of the uh, American police. That's what led to armored cars and rifles. And that's why that's why cops have rifles today where they didn't know. No, no. No, that's not true. Um, people say, well, that's where, you know, that's how they, they developed the 10 millimeter after the FBI Miami shootout. No, the 10 millimeter actually existed before that. So let's let's first of all, let's talk about some of the things uh, Jared and I were having a cigar last night. We were talking about certain instances which cause reverberations in the law enforcement community. And in in our modern era, in the modern era, we've had several big shootouts that caused law enforcement agencies to 
stop and pause and say, maybe we could have done something better, you know, what have you. One of the first ones, well, they're, they're, the big one was the University of Texas clock tower shooting. Uh, Charles Whitman, former Marine, uh, apparently he had some he had some personal problems and so forth. But uh, Whitman took several like I think he had a, a carbine, he had an M1 carbine, he had a six millimeter Remington rifle, I think he had a handgun or something, went up, barricaded himself in the clock tower at the University of Texas and started sniping people. And a lot of people died. That was 1966. And uh, Whitman actually had a brain tumor. And uh, after after they killed him and they did an autopsy on him, they found this brain tumor. And uh, of course, it was back in 66. And people, you know, he was complaining of headaches and, and mood and violent mood swings. Like and he, he said that he felt like he needed to kill people and you know, so on and so forth. Um, and most of the, the, the doctors and pathologists and so forth afterwards, they're like, yeah, we, we believe that, uh, it was this brain tumor that caused Whitman to snap. But 1966, the, the university of Texas, uh, sniper shooting, that was the impetus for the creation of SWAT teams in the United States of America, because up to that point, they really didn't, they didn't exist. And uh, so that was the first one. So in 66, you had the UT sniper. Then you had in 70, this thing called the New Hall incident. And it was uh, in California. Uh, the New Hall massacre. In the New Hall massacre, um, several police officers were shot and killed. The suspects were shot and killed. Uh, but it was a, a, a pretty big deal. It kind of shocked the world. It kind of shocked the nation. Uh, that uh, this went down. That's when they started talking about training. And I mentioned that in my training book about uh, dumping, you know, dumping empty brass into your hand instead of on the ground because we don't want to step on it and so on and so forth. She had the New Hall incident, which was 1970. And uh, you had, it was, it was shocking, right? It shocked the world. Well, then fast forward to the Norco incident. The Norco incident was, again, in California. The Norco shootout was a five heavily armed bank robbers took on uh, several sheriff's deputies and police officers. Um, a police officer was killed. Two perpetrators were killed. 11 people were injured. Uh, it was a, it was like something from a movie. What year was this? 1980. So in 1980, you have the Norco incident and that kind of, and when, with, with these things, we see other stuff like, uh, police officers starting to wear body armor, um, or the development of body armor. Cause in, in the in late seventies, early eighties, body armor was in its infancy especially concealable body armor. We had flak jackets back in Korea. They developed flak jackets, uh, which are big vests with plates in them, you know, and so forth. But they're heavy and the average cop would never wear something like that. So you had Norco, which again was in California in 1980. And uh, in the United States in 1980, we didn't have a 24 hour news cycle. We didn't have an Internet. So if the average person heard about it, they might have read it in the paper, read the story and moved on with their life. And they weren't beat over the head with the story. It wasn't 24 hours a day, nonstop on CNN. So the people, the average person in the United States didn't get that excited about it. Right. So then you move up to the 1986 FBI Miami shootout. Right. Uh, and the the main thing that came out of that was for police agencies. The main thing that came out of for police agencies was training uh, how to do vehicle stops and vehicle takedowns. Like, for instance, uh, there's a pit maneuver. It's called a pit maneuver. And that, that we learned um, when I was in the academy. And uh, 
because they didn't do that pit maneuver. If they'd have done that pit maneuver, they probably could have spun the vehicle out earlier. Yeah. Instead, they were like doing the the demolition derby slam, 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 slam. Right. Um, but for the the people of the United States, the main thing that happened was the FBI came out with a report and they're like the 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 agents on the on the ground did everything they could have and should have and and. You know, we couldn't have asked for anything more from them, but the nine millimeter Winchester silver tipped hollow point didn't do its job. Yes, it did. It's a nine millimeter handgun. It's not a bazooka. It's not a rifle. The nine millimeter bullet caught Platt in his right arm passed all the way through his right arm so it already went through six inches of meat entered his side passed through his lung and stopped just shy of his heart and they said well if the if that round would have done its job why are you asking a nine millimeter round to be a bazooka a handgun is always going to be a handgun so what happened well Rather than say, hey, maybe our tactics weren't up to uh, speed. Now, what Ed points out in the book, and, and, and I have to say he's correct, you know, to be fair. Huh? Yeah. Um, he said they did and they operated as they're expected to. Right. They, they did everything that they trained, you know, it, they did everything that was up to 1986 standards. Right now, we can look at it 30 years later and say, well, they should have done this, should have done this, should have done this. But had 30 years of advancement in tactics. and whatnot. Right. So, uh, you know, in, in, in 1986, you know, that most of the guys were carrying revolvers. Majority of the guys were carrying revolvers uh, because that's what you carried. And, you know, only, the only guys that were allowed to carry semi-automatic handguns were the guys who were SWAT qualified, because we know you have to be SWAT qualified to carry a semi-automatic handgun. Well, and we also know that Glocks are dangerous. And Glocks are dangerous, yeah. Um, so based on that, having laid the majority of the blame on the doorstep of the Winchester Silvertip hollow point, they decided they had to have a bigger, heavier caliber handgun. And so Smith and Wesson said here, it's called the 1006. It is a semi-automatic 10 millimeter large frame pistol. And initially the FBI bought them and started using them. And then they realized that the new 1006 was a 10 millimeter cartridge. They're like, well, yeah, it's a heavy, it's it's fast and heavy and it recoils. So they're like, oh, well, these guns are big. And they they hurt our widow hands when we shoot them. They said, well, there are people in the FBI that don't have big hands or training or and they can't use it. So Winchester, who got butt raped, can I say butt raped? So the FBI and I'm not going to report and, you know, Ed, Ed Morales might be mad at me if I first saying this, but the FBI as an agency, they butt raped Winchester. Because in 1986, the number one law enforcement round in America was the Winchester Silver Tip Hollow Point in 357 Magnum, we 38 have Special. From the producer that rape is a TV approved word. Oh, okay. So I'd say acceptable, not approved. Approved yeah. sounds like it's a good thing. So you here you got Winchester. They're making the Silver Tip Hollow Point. 9 mil, 38 special, 357 Magnum, agencies nationwide are carrying it. Then the FBI comes out and says, that round failed. And so sheriffs and police say, police chiefs and sheriffs panic. They're like, crap, we can't. So they stop buying the round. Right. We, we can't issue that to our people 
because the FBI just did a report that said it's bad. So if we let our officers go out on the street, was that an 86 FBI report? Well, it, it happened after 86. So it probably took place in 87 or 88 or whatever. So they literally, they butt raped Winchester. Winchester's law enforcement sales went from really good to <laughs> crap. And of course, federal was like federal, fe the black guy in the yellow suit by the tree. Yeah. That may, may, that was federal. Federal's like, <laughs> so, look, look at us over there, right? So Winchester had to scramble. They had to scramble to save their law enforcement market. So they did. They came up with an FBI light 10 millimeter round. So they took the 10 millimeter and they cut its balls off and called it the FBI light. But that didn't change the fact that the pistols, the 1006, we're still big, large frame guns. So then the FBI is like, oh, the, these guns are too big. Our guys can't carry them and da, da, da. So Winchester, again, scrambling to save their law enforcement market, partners with Smith and Wesson. They, they all they get in a room together and they're like, what are we going to do? And they came up with the 40 Smith and Wesson. They took a 10 millimeter cartridge, shrunk it down. So that now you can put it in nine millimeter size handguns, not large frame, but medium frame handguns. And that became the solution. Now, we've got 30 some years of hindsight. The, the 40 Smith & Wesson was released in 1990. We have 40 or 30 some years of hindsight. And now we're like, oh. Those old curmudgeonly gun guys who said the 40 is a hot cartridge and it's a brutal cartridge and it's going to beat the guns up yeah. and it's going to break them because they weren't designed for it. They're designed for nine, not 40. Uh, they were all right. <laughs> Those guys were all right. Um, and here we are in 2022 and the FBI has decided, yeah, just just go back to nine mil. Just go back to carrying nine mils. This is the report from 1988. I think that's one of them. Oh, the, I think this is specifically about, let's see. Yeah. So the 10 millimeter was already in existence in 1986. Um, the reason that the FBI did not adopt it and carry it because the pistols were big and they recoiled and they, they you know, they made a lot of noise and they hurt people with little small hands and stuff. So they're like, well, we can't do that. So what are we going to do? Oh, uh, they, they, they were some tactical errors in that, you know, in the F in the book, there were errors that were made, but I, I, you know, I, I can only fault these guys so much. One of the things that we didn't mention was uh, when that Ben Grogan lost his glasses, Ben Grogan was an expert marksman with his glasses on during the crash, there was actually multiple crashes. Um, but when their vehicle crashed, he lost his glasses and he was unable to see clearly now that the rain is gone without his glasses on. And you say, well, that's kind of a BFD. And yeah, it is kind of a BFD. Uh, it's kind of a BFD uh, that he was not able to focus because he needed. And you're just like, well, what are you supposed to do, Paul? I don't know, man. If if you can't see to shoot your gun without your glasses on and you're a cop, you might want to put one of those croaky things on. And you're like, oh, those look gay. Those are stupid looking. I'm not going to put those on my people will make fun of me. Would would you rather be made fun of or would you rather be dead because you were essentially blind and the bad guy killed you because you couldn't see to shoot back? I don't know. You tell me, man. Uh, that was a that was a realistic situation. They had two two guys uh, lost their guns, their primary guns in the crashes. They, they, they crashed their cars and their guns were they had taken their guns out of their holsters 
uh, in anticipation of the of the needing them of needing them. So when they crash, their guns went flying because that's what happens when cars crash is stuff goes flying. Uh, so you had that. You had guys that, you know, one of the guys was supposed to have a shotgun. If you read the book and another guy had borrowed his shotgun and he's like, hey, where's my shotgun? You didn't put it back in my car. He's like, oh, it's in my car. And the guy who had that guy's shotgun was somewhere else. Right. Their radios weren't working properly. They were having uh, trunk issues with their radios. So when Gordon got on the radio and he called out and a warning to his fellow guys, they only heard half of the transmission because there was radio issues. And there were, there were a lot, you know, Ed calls them dominoes. He said there were a lot of dominoes that started falling that morning. And the long story short is sometimes you just have to deal with what, with the cards you've been dealt. And that's what Ed Morales did. He dealt with, he dealt with the cards. He was, you know, he, he played the cards he was dealt. He could have just he cried and said, well, it's not fair. Shouldn't have done. Shouldn't have, shouldn't have, whatever. It did. It didn't matter. Could have, should have, wouldn't. It, it did not matter. The, the fact is he had to play the hand he was dealt and the hand that Ed Morales dealt was a big crap hand, but he did it and uh, he finished it and stop those guys. And now we know now later in hindsight, after a, you know, year long investigation and forensic investigations, numerous reports. And we know now that those guys probably couldn't have gotten very far, but how far, if they would have put that car in drive and driven away, how far could they have gotten? Mm -hmm. How much more damage could they have done? We don't know. Uh, maybe none, maybe a lot. I don't know. They still were armed. They still had guns on them. And then they were going to be in a vehicle. So Ed finished the fight. He ended the fight. Now, the big thing, people are like, yeah, and see, it's the FBI thing. That's, that's why cops have rifles. No, it's not. The reason cops had 40 Smith and Wessons because of the FBI fight. They didn't. Cops didn't start buying rifles till after 9-11. I was a cop. I was in a police, you know, I was in, in police agencies in the in the 90s. And we didn't have black rifles. None of us did. Nobody had black rifles. The only people that had black rifles were the big city SWAT guys. That was it. The patrol rifle did not exist in 91 when I first became a cop. And that was five years after the Miami shootout. And we watched videos and we studied this when I was in the police academy. Um, so, and the, one of the things that we, we talked about last week is a big lesson learned that I don't think many people talk about is one-handed gun operation. You know, you know, we pointed out out of the 10 people that were present, five of them were shot in either the arm or the hand. It's always interesting to me to read the historical things like this, these events that we're talking about and learn about the, uh, the events, or I mean, the, the way the tactics were before that event. Yeah. And it always leads me to the question, why do we wait for things to happen before we, we prepare for those things to happen? Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Like, why would you care? Why would it be acceptable to carry a gun? professionally as a police officer and not train with both hands is it just something that you don't that wasn't thought about well now now we did really when i went to the academy and it might have been because of this you know when i went through the academy we had to shoot single-handed yeah right we had to shoot single-handed left as part of the the thing um and but there are people that won't you know for instance the 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 Navy's qualification, you have to shoot right and left handed, but you're you never shoot single handed. You shoot right, right, right. And then you switch the gun to your left hand and you put your right hand on it. Oh. You never shoot single handed in their qualification course because uh, it's too dangerous. and You might drop the gun you and hurt yourself. To do that. Yeah. Yeah. And why would you want to do that anyway? So. 
But they're, you know, the, the idea that the FBI firefight caused the militarization of American law enforcement is not true. Uh, it, it made cop, many agencies focus on traffic stops, on use of armor, uh, and, you know, so on and so forth. Um, one in, it wasn't that big of a deal, but it made it, some agencies rethink buckshot because Ed Morales used five rounds of buckshot. Uh, and he, and, you know, Ed said that he felt like if he would have had slugs that maybe it would have been better. Maybe the slugs would have penetrated deeper and got them. We don't, you know, we don't know cause he didn't have them, but, uh, uh, the guys did, they did the best they could with the hand they were dealt. There were some mistakes made, but when it came to, you know, why did they carry this? Why do they have revolvers? Why did they have J frames and stuff? That's because in 1986, that's what the agency said was the proper thing to have. And so they were doing what the, you know, what they were told. They were carrying what was approved, what was authorized. You know, it's a good book. Uh, and if you claim to be a small arms and tactics instructor or firearms instructor, or you just want to have some good information in your brain, get this book, buy it, read it, consume it. And uh, that way you'll have the information instead of just being one of those guys that makes decisions based on nothing. It wasn't a book. It was nothing. No. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, I truly appreciate it. Uh, thanks for joining Student of the Gun. If you'd like to join us for tomorrow's episode, for Thursday's episode, go to where? GetSOTG.com. That's right. GetSOTG.com. Follow the instructions, and we'll see you on Thursday. Until then, because we're going to talk about squat tampons, and you definitely want to be there. <laughs> but until then, remember, you're a beginner once, you're a student for life. We appreciate your reviews. If you haven't left a review or updated yours recently, head on over to Facebook, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, or your favorite podcast player to voice your opinion. Don't forget to join us at The Student Lounge, a place for like-minded individuals to learn, connect, and support each other. No chicanery will be tolerated. Remember to check studentofthegun.com daily for new free content and giveaways. Watch, listen, read, shop, and connect at studentofthegun.com. Are you a social butterfly? Connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter for new content each and every day at Student of the Gun. Watch Student of the Gun TV and videos from our trusted partners on Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV, Chromecast, and even AirPlay. Go to studentofthegun.com for direct links. And remember, you're a beginner once, a student for life.